I'd be I'd be drowning in mugs if that, if that was the case. We're ready to go, by the way. I don't know okay. if for me. Good afternoon. Good morning. Chris O'Connor here from uh, Jack Hartfillier, and welcome to the Jack Hartfillier 2020 Virtual Journal Club. This is our last journal club of the year, and uh, we're very excited to be discussing a, a extremely important uh, randomized controlled clinical trial entitled The Effects of a Novel Nitroxyl Donor in Acute Heart Failure, the Stand Up AHF Study. But before we jump into that, let me give you a brief overview of the journal and uh, where things are. Next slide. Next slide. I'm here today with uh, several of our associate editors. Um, uh, Dr. Fuzat, the executive editor, Dr. Mitch Sapka uh, is here, Dr. Maria Rosa Constanzo, and uh, other associate editors will be joining. Uh, Dr. Barry Greenberg is uh, one of our guest editors and also uh, discussant for this important paper. Next slide. Well, Jack Heart Failure is a, uh, um, a journal that really focuses on a clinically relevant um, uh, clinical knowledge and information. Uh, we recently had an adjustment upward in our impact factor to 9.14, uh, over 1,000 submissions a year, 58% are international, uh, with an accepted rate of 10% and over 500,000 downloads last year. Next slide. The top content for the uh, journal is, is shown here. Really, pharmacology tends to be a very popular uh, subject matter for the journal. Uh, other subject matters that are, are timely uh, in 2020 include uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, the comorbidity surrounding heart failure, and acute heart failure, which will be the topic of today. Next slide. Many innovative initiatives are, are associated with the journal. Uh, as you can see here, we, we try to focus on clinical uh, research and clinical trials. Our dead letter office uh, is, is a, uh, an effort to resurrect clinical trials that have not been published. Uh, the one you see here on Flasequinon had been uh, not in the public eye for uh, over 20 years uh, until it became published. Um, we, we try to highlight uh, special dedicated uh, focus uh, issues and, and uh, dedicated issues to uh, topics such as uh, cardiac transplantation, most recently cardiogenic shock. Uh, and we also have columns uh, that reflect the patient perspective uh, that has been very popular with our readership. Next slide. And here's just a, a listing of some of the top uh, 25 citations um, most recently. And as you can see, um, iron uh, is a very timely topic uh, in heart failure today uh, with the recently published Affirm AHF study in Lancet. Um, but much uh, work around um, disparities, pharmacology, outcomes, uh, cardiogenic shock, these are, these are the, some of the top uh, topics that have uh, come through the journal. Next slide. And so I'm very pleased to have uh, two of my uh, dear colleagues uh, presenting uh, the stand up AHF trial, the effects of a novel nitroxyl donor in acute heart failure, Dr. Michael Felker, who's professor of medicine at Duke University, and Dr. John McMurray, who is uh, a professor at uh, the University of Glasgow. And uh, uh, we're uh, looking forward to uh, their comments. But in addition, next slide, we have Dr. Barry Greenberg, who wrote the editorial comment and not only commenting on the trial itself, but the field of drug development and acute heart failure, the challenges and the opportunities. Next slide. Uh, and this is supported by the American College of Cardiology. Next slide. 
So Mike, uh, stand up AHF. Let's hear an overview. Great, thank you, Chris, uh, and pleasure to be here. Um, and joined, as Chris said, by uh, my uh, co-principal investigator John McMurray from Glasgow. So I'm going to provide a brief overview of the trial and the main results, and then uh, look forward to a great, great discussion. So next slide. So as we all know, uh, acute heart failure is a common condition where we've really been challenged to develop uh, new treatments. Uh, the HNO or nitroxyl donors are a novel class of medications um, or potential medications, although HNO sounds a little bit like NO or nitric oxide. This is a biologically distinct uh, class of agents. They work by modifying thiol residues on target proteins. Um, and this particular drug um, impacts a variety of proteins engaged in calcium signaling, including circuit 2A and the ranidine receptor. It also increases calcium sensitivity uh, um, in the uh, machinery of contraction. And finally, is a peripheral vasodilator through its impact on uh, guanylate cyclase. So from a physiologic standpoint, it is an inotrope, a lucitrope that has improved cardiac relaxation and also a vasodilator a combination of properties which seem extremely attractive as a therapeutic for acute heart failure. And this particular HNO donor, Simlanod, was the focus of uh, Stand Up AHF. Next slide. So, uh, Stand Up AHF was a phase two study. And the patients we studied, we targeted patients who had an injection fraction below 40% because, again, one of the potential properties of this agent was uh, that it's an inotrope. They had to be hospitalized for heart failure. They needed signs and symptoms of congestion, including elevated neutrotic peptides. Uh, there was a window of enrollment. It started out at 18 hours and later expanded to 48 hours. I'll speak to that. Uh, later, we focused on people with elevated blood pressure, but not extremely elevated. So the the blood pressure range was between 105 and 160, and other inclusion and exclusion criteria are listed here. Next slide. So, uh, and this is maybe a good topic for discussion later. The stand up was a phase two trial, so a big part of our goals were to do dose ranging and understand dose response. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. It can be a substantial challenge in trial design. Um, we designed stand up in two parts. Part one was a, uh, a randomized uh, 100 patients, either placebo or uh, Simlanod, which is also called BMS 962 through one, um, uh, with a forced up titration. So patients started at a low dose and gradually every four hours were up titrated as they tolerated. After the end of phase one, there was an interim analysis and two doses uh, were selected to move forward into, phase, into part two. Part two was a three-arm trial where patients were randomized to either placebo and either or of the two doses selected, which uh, were six and 12 micrograms per kilogram uh, per minute. Treatment was for 48 hours, um, and then therapy was um, uh, 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 discontinued and, and uh, other assessments, which I'll talk about. Next slide. Next slide. Can we skip back? So the primary endpoint, what, just one. There you go. Uh, so as a phase two trial, we thought a lot about how to design a trial that would give us signals for both e efficacy and safety. As a drug with vasodilator properties, a major concern was identifying a dose or doses that were tolerated in the population you wanted to study and potentially treat with regard to hypotension. So the primary endpoint for stand-up was clinically relevant hypotension defined as either symptomatic hypotension or blood pressure less than 90. The key secondary points were around change in nature rate of peptide and improvement in symptoms of, of dyspnea or breathlessness and a variety of exploratory endpoints listed here. Next slide. So I won't belabor the baseline characteristics. These are generally similar to what we've seen in other acute heart failure trials. Uh, the patient uh, ejection fraction was relatively low because of the inclusion criteria that it had to be less than 40. 
um, they had mild renal dis, uh, dysfunction and uh, sort of moderate blood pressure in the uh, 120s for systolic uh, blood pressure. Next slide. So these are results from part one. Remember part one, uh, patients were randomized to either placebo or up titration um, um, of a study drug through three dose levels. Not unexpectedly uh, for a vasodilator, a treatment with Simlanod was associated with a drop in blood pressure relative to placebo. And again, not unexpectedly, there was more hypotension in the Simlanod um, arm. If you look on the panel on the right, uh, symptomatic hypotension, which is shown in the orange color, was relatively uncommon. Most of the drops in blood pressure represented asymptomatic drops uh, to a blood pressure less than 90. And again, from these data, we selected at an interim analysis in conjunction with the sponsor and the DSMB two doses uh, to move forward into the following uh, uh, part of the trial, part two. So next slide. So these are the data for part two with regard to the primary endpoint of clinically relevant hypotension. And um, I think what you can see is there was a modest increase in hypotension uh, moving from placebo to six. Uh, this was not statistically significant. And again, uh, the vast majority was asymptomatic um, blood pressure less than 90. In the patient's treatment with Simulanod 12, there was quite a bit more hypotension, approximately twice as much. Uh, which was nominally statistically significant and also included more symptomatic hypotension. Next slide. Uh, this shows just hemodynamic data on uh, blood pressure on the top and heart rate on the bottom. Um, again, not surprisingly, there was a dose response in blood pressure, particularly marked in the high dose uh, arm with Simlanod. And interestingly, um, you know, one of the things you're concerned about with vasodilators is reflex tachycardia. Uh, we, we did see a suggestion of that with the 12, but not with a medium dose of, of six, which actually lowered heart rate somewhat similarly to placebo. Next slide. And so these are some efficacy data around the secondary endpoints. Uh, first for NT pro BNP, as you can see in the shaded period, which is the treatment period during treatment, there was a, a fairly uh, important, I think, drop in natriuretic peptide levels uh, that was more or less similar um, uh, by dose um, and, and was greater than placebo. If you look at the proportion of patients who had a 30% uh, reduction at 48 hours, uh, it was about 47% in placebo, about 62% in Simulanod 6 and 71% in Simulanod 12. So improvement in nature of peptides during treatment suggestive of decongestion, but an important theme is that after the drug was stopped, uh, uh, these numbers, uh, this difference uh, tended to um, diminish. Next slide. Next slide. Whoop, back one. Uh, this is the other secondary endpoint of uh, dyspnea. Um, as we've seen in other trials, dyspnea tended to improve in all the groups and was relatively similar and no real difference between placebo and either of the doses of Simulanod. Next slide. Uh, this is data about creatinine and bilirubin. Um, interestingly, during treatment, we saw a, a modest, but uh, I think real rise in creatinine in both the Simulanod treated patients. Um, I think this could be interpreted as, um, or potentially interpreted as decongestion, and we saw a fairly dramatic decrease in serum bilirubin, which again, we've seen in other trials, a suggestion of decongestion. Again, these um, were present during the 48 hours of treatment, but then uh, waned fairly quickly once treatment was discontinued. Next slide. So these are clinical endpoint data. The trial wasn't really powered for clinical endpoints, and broadly speaking, there was no major difference across uh, across these treatments, if you're an optimist, you could uh, maybe suggest some uh, improvement in some of the clinical uh, event rates like rehospitalization um, uh, in the Simulanod group in part two. But again, these are very small numbers, and I think we're not really suggestive of a major, a major difference. The so next slide. And this is uh, safety. There were more adverse events in the Simulanod group. Those were almost all from hypotension. If you look at serious adverse events, there were actually fewer in the Simulanod group. Um, 
so I think it's safe to say, other than the blood pressure issue, which we expect with vasodilators, um, this drug was relatively well tolerated. Next slide. And so just some conclusion, I think, uh, you know, looking at the ranging, I think the dose of six, which was the middle dose, was reasonably well tolerated. I think 12 caused what we would consider to be an unacceptable high level of hypotension. Um, Treatment with Simonod improved some of the assign, uh, signs, at least by biomarkers of congestion, um, such as NT per BNP. Uh, bilirubin had a um, effect on uh, creatinine. We thought was uh, suggestive of decongestion, but this was not persistent. And we didn't see an effect on symptoms, and we didn't see an effect on post discharge outcomes uh, that would lead us to affect that these were longer lasting. Uh, benefits, which I think is a key issue in acute heart failure treatments, which I'm sure we'll um, talk about some more. So, next slide, I think that's the end. So, I uh, want to welcome John McMurray, uh, again, who's the co-PI of Stand Up, to give uh, some thoughts um, on the trial and maybe on uh, the space of developing drugs in acute heart failure. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Um, so, um, I suppose the, the things I would highlight from, from your presentation and from this trial are that I think we've shown a very nice way to try and establish the dose in a phase two study that one might move forward with in a phase, phase three trial. Obviously, this was part of a somewhat larger program of trying to understand how this drug worked, but I think you showed very nicely that we sort of find the sweet spot we want to call it in terms of dosing. Uh, six was fine, 12 causing a reflex tachycardia, not what you want to see. Um, I, I think we made an observation uh, that is extremely interesting in the sense that it replicates something that we've seen previously. And I'm thinking particularly of the true AHF trial, which Dr. O'Connor was very much involved in with Ularitide, where we saw this almost like putting on a tourniquet effect where during the infusion, we seem to uh, decongest the patient. Um, we seem to do what we wanted to achieve. But as soon as you stop the drug, you saw almost a rebound and actually, in true AHF with a different vasodilator, uh, that those those pharmacological changes uh, were accompanied by changes in clinical events. So it is, I suppose, always been the question. I think Barry Greenberg will come back to this about you know, can you ever hope to achieve long-term improvements with just a short-term infusion? Um, I think this study also illustrated how difficult it is to show a difference between an active therapy and placebo in terms of dyspnea, because dyspnea is a moving target, it's changing, it's improving with conventional therapy. Uh, we clearly showed, I think, uh, decongestion of what's called at least reduction in natriuretic peptides, bilirubin, increase in creatinine. Although I think it does beg the question, why was that occurring? This isn't a diuretic. What does decongestion with a vasodilator actually mean? And why might it be preferable to decongest somebody if that's what we're doing with a vasodilator as opposed to just using a conventional diuretic? Um, and I think that then also brings us on to mechanisms which I think we I want to discuss later what is this drug doing? Is it, is it primarily a dilator? Is it an arterial vasodilator? Is it uh, redistributing blood volume in some way? And is, is that how it's having the effect on natriuretic peptides and so on? So, um, those would, I think, might be my comments. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, really, really insightful and uh, uh, Complement to the design. I mean, phase two is hard in this field, and doing and uh, figuring out the dose is just uh, and the way you do this by combining part one and part two is really uh, creative. Uh, I can ask Barry Greenberg to make comments. He wrote the editorial on this paper. Barry, 
Sure. Well, thanks very much, Chris. And uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate uh, Mike and John and the other investigators in the stand up study. Uh, this was a really uh, well done clinical trial, well designed and well carried out uh, in a very difficult population to study. Uh, I did write the editorial along with a colleague of mine at the University of California, San Diego, Tony Uri, and I'd like to acknowledge his contribution. Uh, I was fascinated by this study. I uh, particularly uh, liked seeing the way that the dosing was worked out uh, in a well-defined population in a very thoughtful manner in which uh, phase one and phase two literally rolled into one another, making for some economy of time and identifying a dose which was safe in this population uh, in a relatively short order. Uh, the drug itself is quite an interesting one in that it has so many effects, which at least theoretically would be of some benefit in a heart failure population, particularly individuals who are coming in with evidence of decompensation. So what the study did quite well was then identify a dose that could be used as a therapy and one would feel relatively comfortable that the drug would do no harm. So the other side of that coin, of course, is whether or not there would be benefits. And one would look at benefits in a couple of different ways. Uh, and the study indeed did that. Uh, they looked at some short-term benefits and also at least gave us some data about, long, about longer-term benefits Although, as uh, Dr. Felker pointed out, the study certainly was not powered to do that. Identifying short-term clinically relevant endpoints during an acute heart failure hospitalization is extremely difficult, uh, in part because uh, all of our focus is on making the patient feel better during that time. These individuals have come in with a symptom complex, which is quite concerning to them. And our job as healthcare providers is to try to relieve those symptoms. Coincidentally, the endpoints, or at least the clinically centric endpoints of many of the trials in acute heart failure are relief of symptoms. So that we're looking at the dueling effects of the therapy that we're trying to test and the therapies which we're using, which are already available to try to relieve those symptoms. And I find it, and I think the previous clinical trials have all found it very difficult to sort out clear-cut evidence of improvement in symptoms while the patient is in the hospital. The other aspect of looking at drugs for managing acute heart failure is whether they could somehow improve the extended outcome of patients. And this is a real issue for us uh, because if we look at the data, we see that patients following a heart failure hospitalization are experiencing an extremely high rate of recidivism, and over a six-month period, about 50% of them end up coming back in the hospital. Mortality at one year ranges somewhere around 30%, so very high-risk, vulnerable population. And one must ask whether or not that heart failure hospitalization is an event that identifies patients who are preordained to going on to doing poorly, or is something going on, is the pathophysiology reset at that time, and that's what causes them to do poorly in the future. 
going back to therapies then that one would consider developing in the throes of acute heart failure, you would ask, is the therapy that would be administered acutely, could that somehow reset the pathophysiology so that over time there would be a favorable effect on longer term outcomes? That's been the paradigm for clinical trials for the last two decades. And unfortunately, it's failed in virtually every case. There have been no drugs that have been treated, that have been used with treatment over a 48 hour period during an acute heart failure hospitalization that have resulted in any improvement in longer term outcomes, specifically rehospitalization rates or mortality after discharge. So the question comes up with this drug, which the effects look real, the uh, data that Dr. Felker presented about the decongestion does indeed look real, but it also appears to be quite transient. Seen at 48 hours and then resolving at 72 hours, the biomarker pattern that was seen early on pretty much had resolved even before the patient was discharged. So one would ask the question then, would this kind of a therapy really be expected to have long-term benefits in a acute heart failure population? And I think it's time that the field really take a long and hard look at this, whether or not this is the appropriate way to design a clinical trial. I'd like to raise one other question, and I'm very curious to uh, hear feedback about this from the panelists, and that is, what should be the markers or signals of efficacy in a phase two trial for acute heart failure? I think that's been an issue that has been very, very troublesome to us We've looked at uh, things like biomarkers and so on, but there are questions about how representative those are going to be regarding some of the clinical outcomes we're looking at. So I'll finish up by saying congratulations again to the investigators. Uh, you presented a, a beautifully done study and you've raised a number of questions about this entity of acute heart failure and how drugs might be developed in the future. Thank, thanks, Barry. And uh, for the audience, the chat is open for questions if you have questions, but let's, uh, let's let Mike and John respond and then we'll have our associate editors uh, ask some questions. Thanks, Chris. So, I, you know, I think Barry said it very well. If you look at the history of this sort of area of research um, going back, uh, you know, to trials like uh, Veritas and Optime uh, to more contemporary trials. Now we've got Ascend, uh, we've got uh, Relax 1 and 2, we've got True, and, and we've got uh, Blast, we've got Stand Up. There's a long list of these trials. Um, and it really, I think, at some point, you have to start grappling with the fact that it's not um, it's not the specific agent, uh, perhaps, but just the paradigm we're using um, that short-term treatment, um, while it may have some transient benefits, um, it's just hard to imagine longer-term um, uh, change in the trajectory of patients from such short treatments. But I, um, I'm interested in John's opinion as well. I might go a step further, Mike. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with the words you've said, but I have to say I thought the collapse of the AHF trial, Christian Muller's study in JAMA, was maybe even more perturbing because there, of course, not only did they use initial vasodilatation like we've done in this trial, but then they continued that. So they used oral vasodilator therapy. So it wasn't just for 48 hours, they used that as a bridge to longer term uh, vasodilatation and, and that didn't improve outcome either. So I'm now wondering, 
maybe it's more than just the duration of the treatment, maybe the whole concept of vasodilatation is wrong. And um, it takes me back a little bit to something you and I um, and uh, Chris O'Connor discussed about this drug because we did a parallel study uh, in, in ambulatory patients uh, looking at echocardiographic changes. I think the surprise at least I got was that uh, the vasodilators in, in some patients, of course, can actually reduce cardiac output if they have a predominantly venodilator tree load reducing effect. So they're complex drugs, and uh, they're not the same, and their their effects probably vary according to the hemodynamic status of the patient. So it is a really, really difficult uh, jigsaw to put together, I think. So um Maria Rosa, uh, let's hear, you've been uh, in this field looking at the uh, different ways to decongest. Uh, you, you've led some mechanical decongestion trials. Um, what are your thoughts? John is saying that maybe we, we sh the vasodilators are over, and, uh, and Mike's saying it's certainly short-term, 48 hours. We probably have run the gamut. What, what are your thoughts, Maria Rosa? Well, that may be the case, and certainly I would like to congratulate Mike and John, but as I was um, reading the paper, um, I was wondering why they made it so hard for themselves. <laughs> and uh, the reason is that they called clinically relevant hypotension uh, a blood pressure of equal to uh, or less than 90 and or symptomatic hypotension. Um, clinically, um, in fact, I, I often write orders not to change the doses of medication unless the patient is symptomatic. Um, but with the uh, now with the new information we are getting from the shock world, a blood pressure may not be the number itself may not necessarily mean uh, hypoperfusion. Uh, I certainly don't change medications in patients that have that type of blood pressure that don't have symptoms. And I was impressed by the fact that in the study, the vast majority of patients had asymptomatic hypotension. That's my first observation. The other questions I would like to ask is, what happened to diuretic therapy and dosage during treatment? And um, I noted um, actually, I should have noted it when I read the paper, but I noted today that it seems that with the 12 micrograms per kilogram per minute dose, there was a more prolonged effect on the BNP. So thanks, Maria Rosa. Uh, excellent comments as always. Yeah, we talked a lot about what, you know, there's a uh, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Obviously, you don't want to cause hypo symptomatic hypotension in patients uh, who are acutely ill, because we all, I think, um, believe that's bad. On the other hand, uh, vasodilators, if they do work, one of the ways they work is by decreasing afterload and um, improving um, hemodynamics in that way. So, you know, we could have chosen a different number or... Um, or just symptomatic hypotension. But um, you know, we, we also talked about whether there was a particular drop in blood pressure that was too much, but but that's quite challenging because you come in at 120 and your blood pressure drops by, by 50, that's very problematic. If you come in at 200 and your blood pressure drops by 50, that's good. So, um, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's definitely a big challenge. I think there is a suggestion that at least hemodynamically, 12, the dose of 12 was more effective, and certainly if you look at NT pro BNP, but from a safety perspective, between the greater incidence of symptomatic hypotension and the reflex tachycardia, I think that would be pretty um, 
still learning. If I could add to that as well, Maria Rosa, I mean, remember the baseline blood pressure in these patients was 100, and the average was 125 millimeters of mercury. So dropping to 90 is, is a fairly large drop. And again, I think it all depends on A, the patient's circumstances. And, and um, you know, obviously in a chronic ambulatory FRF patient, many of them may have a blood pressure of, of 90 systolic. And of course, none of us are bothered by that. But dropping a blood pressure sharply, if that's associated with the reflex tachycardia, and it might be due to excessive preload reduction, that's not a good thing. And, and if you know better than I do, all our previous trials with vasodilators tell us that hypotension, induced hypotension, is associated with the worst outcome. And actually, recently in um, the Elizabeth trial, I think it was the, the trial in older patients with nitrates that was recently published, um, the patients who randomized to nitrates as part of their management of acute heart failure, more of them ended up in the intensive care unit. Uh, and they certainly didn't do any better overall than patients who were treated largely with diuretics. So again, it, it, it may be that there are certain patients benefit from vasodilatation. But I think you really have to know who those patients are and, and what the vasodilator you're using is and how it's working. And I don't think we've got that very well worked out. Um, did you allow uh, the investigators to decide the dose of diuretics or did you give guidelines for the use of diuretics? No, it was per, per usual care. And um, you asked about, sorry, I, 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 you asked about um, diuretic dose. Um, we don't actually have very granular information about what happened with diuretic dosing um, during treatment. Um, which is, uh, you know, would be interesting, but. Um, by the way, I have learned uh, the use of the term granular for, for Dr. Greenberg. So that's very appropriate. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Um, Sopka, Dr. Sopka, let's hear from you. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I must say my, my overall impression is is the same as has been uh, expressed by so many people here, which is that um, you know this this is an interesting space. We would love to have better therapies for our patients with acute heart failure, um, and sometimes we do find that they have symptomatic improvement um, with vasodilator therapy. Sometimes they require, particularly in the shock spaces, Maria Rosa mentioned um, uh, vasodilators plus. Um, uh, cardiac contractility augmentation through uh, changing calcium fluxes, uh, as we do in so many ways. Um, but uh, really, um, if we're talking about long-term benefit, it, it is, it's become harder and harder to see a pathway forward in the acute space unless someone is really unable to be improved um, by our standard and, as I will mention, relatively cheap therapies uh, that we currently have. Um, and so, thinking about this from a um, viability of a uh, new therapeutic brought to market, um, I really continue to question uh, the strategic viability of a, of a, uh, of a new in that space. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, if you look at other development programs, I think that um, it's really moving away from this sort of area, the kind of run of the mill uh, heart failure exacerbation, mainly with volume overload, um, they're still relatively hypertensive and not being hypotensive. Uh, and so into, uh, you know, what medications can be started that are going to be continued as an outpatient for students with the SGLT2 inhibitors and others. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, uh, what is needed for patients who are in the peri shock or uh, true cardiogenic shock um, stage where uh, if you they are not rescued, they may not survive, and and that is a uh, kind of a more clear outcome that it, it is more clearly clinically meaningful. So I think we're probably moving away from this into those divergent uh, places. 
Dr. Fusat? Yeah, I, I mean, I congratulate obviously the uh, excellent investigation, um, very important to continue these trials. Um, you know, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Nasiratide story, um, which is maybe you don't see big impact on all kinds of endpoints, and nonetheless, there's going to be some patients who benefit. From it. I think, um, you know, it was an important dose finding study. I think further investigation of the six milligram or microgram dose would um, would be a good next step. You know, I, I think John brought up in the chat, um, you know, we talk about short-term therapies and, and their failures, but obviously IV, IV iron um, was a very short-term therapy and it looks like it has a pretty significant signal and uh, but, that's but, probably. But really that's that's just um, application of, a, of a, an outpatient therapy in the inpatient setting. There's nothing about um, IV iron that's sp specifically designed to treat the decompensated state, I would put it in along with the Arnie's and Pioneer and now the SGLT2 inhibitors and the signal from Sololist that Mitch brought up the idea that doing things that are good for you chronically, that the hospital is a great opportunity to initiate those and, and we should focus on taking advantage of them. I, I, suppose, I suppose, Mike, it's a theoretical proof that it is possible to give something by short-term infusion that leads to long-term benefits. And I agree with you whether that's in the outpatient or inpatient setting is probably irrelevant. Uh, so it was more to not completely dismiss the idea, but I agree with you. It's becoming harder and harder to believe that short-term administration, certainly of a vasodilator, can lead to long-term improvement. Although it doesn't mean that it's impossible that short-term administration of a vasodilator couldn't lead to short-term improvement, shortening of length of stay. Um, we, we don't talk very much about it. I mean, we do prefer to avoid inducing renal dysfunction and other problems, electrolyte disturbance, et cetera, which we do with diuretics, which remain really our, our standard of care for dealing with acute breathlessness and, and congestion. And maybe there's a better way to relieve congestion um, I don't know if it's a diuretic. I don't know what diuretic is, but I, I, I suppose it's not impossible. Uh, can I ask? I don't know um, if this has been done already, uh, but would you consider a, a small um, mechanistic trial to look at the objective hemodynamic effects of the drug? <laughs> Uh, so there, yeah. So there has been a, a, a one sort of traditional Swan GANS uh, trial, which was uh, I think published in European Journal of Heart Failure. I can't remember, but um, that was some time ago. And then uh, we did, as I think John alluded to, a mechanistic trial using ECHO, looking at the comparison between placebo nitrates and Simulanod in in outpatients, um, which. Um, you know, again, had some interesting findings, but I don't think findings that supported the idea of this particular agent moving into broader clinical use. But one of the issues that comes up is that we tend uh, to look in these clinical trials at the uh, population as being a homogeneous one. And we know from our clinical practice and from our observations of these patients that there are anything but that, that it's quite a heterogeneous population. So the question I have for uh, Michael and John is whether or not you looked at some of these subgroups, perhaps people with more acute onset heart failure, uh, the flash pulmonary edema subgroup, or those individuals that had higher blood pressure uh, was there any difference in their response to this agent? No, thanks, Barry. I mean, one of the challenges, of course, that this was a relatively small trial. The part two was, uh, I think, a little over 200 patients. So the ability, we, we did look at some subgroups. We didn't see strong signals that there's 
one particular subgroup that um, that is benefits or is or alternatively is harmed, but it's quite limited by the very small sample size of a phase two trial. Back, back to the issue that I raised uh, earlier also, and that is looking for efficacy signals in relatively limited sized phase two studies uh, to know whether or not it's appropriate to go on to phase three. I find that one of the more vexing issues that we deal with. Well, Barry, I mean, I must say I was pleasantly surprised in some ways that we saw what you might call a coherent set of changes, reduction in natriuretic peptides, reduction in bilirubin, small rise in creatinine. Mm -hmm. That certainly suggests for what you might describe de as decongestion. And of course, that I think would be by and large a desirable thing to do in these patients. Provided, of course, you don't cause excessive hypotension, um, don't cause other problems. So, um, I mean, the, the, I thought overall this trial was very successful in what it set out to do in terms of uh, finding the dose that was safe to administer. I thought we, we definitely saw the ceiling, which was probably six micrograms per kilogram. And, uh, and in addition to that, we got biomarkers that were consistent with decongestion. So as far as it goes, I think this is probably most of what you can do in a phase two trial, at least without doing invasive uh, hemodynamic measurements, which are, I think, really challenging to do. Really well said. Our newest uh, uh, member of the AE team, uh, Nazarene Ibrahim, would you like to ask a question? No, uh, I would just say congrats to Dr. Svelker and McMurray. It's really difficult to do these trials, but it's awesome. And, you know, the enrollment from 13 countries was also great. And it's an exciting time to be in heart failure. But I would say, like, uh, I would agree with all the other comments made that, you know, we have GDMT that we know reduces morbidity and mortality, but there could be a, a place for um, medication like this just for the short term when patients are admitted in the ICUs or CCUs with acute decompensated heart failure. Can this potentially um, reduce length of stay in the ICU by, you know, speeding up um, decongestion efforts as opposed to using diuretic alone? But again, uh, it's a matter of the hypotension and which patient populations this would be okay in. But um, again, it's an exciting time and I would congratulate them on this trial. Thank you. Well, Mike and John, maybe closing comments and. Uh... Sure, so maybe I'll start. I mean, I, I thought this was a great discussion. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that we sort of have in the background of all these discussions about acute heart failure treatment is we all say we're left with just diuretics, but um, but actually we haven't spent very much time figuring out how to do diuretics better. And actually I think that that uh, sort of that piece of acute decongestion is still ripe for some innovation. As far as I know, the biggest diuretic trial ever done is 308 patients. So there's, uh, I think there's opportunities to uh, to do better, both with diuretics and potentially other other tools. Um, but I, there's 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 um, still work to do for all of us. I hope for the years to come. Uh, and uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for the very interesting comments. I thought Mitch said it very well. I mean, I, I almost see these patients largely compartmentalized into those who really are acutely unwell. And I think that's part of the interest of this condition because I think it's changing. So we do have the rare group of patients who are very sick indeed, hypoperfused. Maria Rosa, I think, used the important word, which is perfusion, not pressure. Uh, and then there are the many patients now, I think, who probably make up the majority of these individuals who actually are reasonably well perfused. The problem is congestion. Over many weeks, in a very subacute way, they've accumulated fluid. They're not really urgent in the sense that I think we used to see many of these patients, at least when I was a, a younger doctor uh, who presented in acute pulmonary edema very unwell. Those are certainly where I work are much less common and it's, it's generally an older population 
with pronounced congestion, often impaired renal function. And they're much more the common challenge that we deal with. And maybe we have to start to, to refocus on, on who it is we're trying to help and what it is we're trying to do. Well, thank you, uh, John and Mike, and thank uh, thank the panelists uh, for a terrific discussion today. And uh, we uh, we we hope this has provided some insight and and perhaps a path forward for uh, helping our our heart failure patients uh, who have uh, acute compensation. So, thank you for joining the journal club today. And uh, this this obviously is recorded and will be available uh, um, uh, at later dates for for review also. Have a good day. Thank you all.